first of all, I, uh, it's good to be back in Paris. Uh, I uh, presented a little bit of uh, early stages of this uh, project uh, years ago because uh, I'm working on this topic for 12 years now. Uh, I want to uh, really express my uh, gratitude to Sarah and Brian for uh, hosting or inviting me first and then hosting uh, this, uh, this event. So, uh, Coming to the topic, uh, in the Third Reich, the Gestapo and the SS uh, complained a lot in their reports about the impudent Jew. For example, in March 1935, the Gestapo in Aachen reported that, quote, the number of Jews who had sent letters and protested in person has become quite numerous and in their tone often impudent, end of quote. Still during the war, so several years later, the Reich Main Security Office in Berlin emphasized in its April 1940 report that it received information about the impudent attitude of Jews from various corners of the Reich. Historians, including myself, have generally understood the frequent reference to impudent Jews in Gestapo and SS uh, reports as a trope with the sole purpose of providing Nazi officials with the pretext to radicalize persecution. Yet the impudent Jew was not just Nazi rhetoric. In fall 1942, around 1,200 Jews served sentences for political and criminal offenses in prisons across the German Reich. Hence, the frequent Nazi talk about Jewish, Jewish impudence points to a forgotten reality of widespread resistance of individual Jews. Let me start with one story which took, in, uh, took place in Berlin, the capital of the Third Reich during the war. Hertha Reis was a 36-year-old Jewish woman who toiled as a forced laborer. She had been earlier order to move out of her apartment into a very small sublet room, which she had to share with her mother and her son. Now in 1941, a judge evicted the family even from this tiny last resort of privacy. Having nowhere to go, she protested in broad daylight in front of the Berlin courthouse, quote, we lost everything because of the damned government we finally lost our home too. This thug Hitler, the damned government, the damned people, just because we are Jews, we are discriminated against." End of quote. It's amazing that after eight years of Nazi rule, this Jewish woman had the courage to protest in plain daylight in the capital of, uh, of the Third Reich. And her story challenges the widespread belief in the alleged passive suffering of German Jews under Nazi persecution. During the last decade, my systematic research revealed that hundreds, literally hundreds of Jews did individually resist Nazi persecution. And the rediscovery is of these forgotten acts uh, requests a reassessment of Jewish responses towards Nazi persecution. So in my presentation today, I will briefly discuss the state of research and point to reasons why I think that scholars have overlooked such kind of individual resistance. And then I will give you an overview how German Jews defied Nazi persecution in various way, different ways between 1933 and 1945 in Nazi Germany. So first about the development of research. Until now, the public and most researchers subscribe to the idea that Jews in general, but particularly German Jews, did not resist the terrors of the Third Reich. The traditional perception of their passivity had been nourished by the fact that historians have discussed Jewish resistance during the Holocaust, mostly in terms of organized or armed group activities. Moreover, in the beginning of the 1960s, as many of you know, uh, you know Hannah Arendt, um, Raoul Hilberg, but also Bruno Bettelheim, all criticized the alleged lack of Jewish resistance. Although this was immediately uh, questioned by Israeli scholars, and 
now there was a discussion about moral and spiritual resistance. However, academia and most scholars settled on organized and armed resistance and its rare, rare occurrence in the Eastern occupied territories. As one can see, even in recent publications like uh, Yevgeny Finkel's Ordinary Jews. Hence, a systematic evaluation of individual Jewish resistance is missing in all, almost, or actually in all prominent Holocaust narratives. Even those who focus on the inclusion and integration of Jewish voices as the works of, uh, the acclaimed works of Saul Friedland. And I think there are two main reasons uh, to explain this void. One is a limited conceptual understanding what resistance is, and the other is uh, a limited source base uh, for, uh, of previous research. So what I try to do in my research I, uh, is to broaden the concept uh, and the understanding of resistance. And this is not nothing which I invented. Uh, uh, I'm just reviving existing uh, methodological reproaches uh, already uh, brought up in the 1950s by the Israeli scholar Meir Dvodzetsky, uh, then uh, revived in the 1970s by the Australian historian Konrad Kreet and the East German survivor Helmut Eschweg. They all tried uh, to open up the definition of resistance towards individual activities. Similar views were raised in a debate about general resistance in Nazi Germany in the 1980s in Germany, where uh, anti-Nazi attitudes were discussed on a wider scale. And the then young German historian Detlef Peukert included uh, nonconformity, defiance, and protest. But also beyond Holocaust history, uh, things as resistance were discussed in a similar way, for example, by James Scott with the small deeds uh, and um, also by scholars on US slavery. Based on such a broader conceptualization, I amended a well-known definition by Yehuda Bauer. And let me share my PowerPoint now. I hope you can see this. So uh, I uh, created this definition uh, in the process of my research uh, just by adding one word, individual, to Yehuda Bauer's uh, widely used uh, definition of Jewish resistance. So any individual action is in opposition to known laws and actions and intentions can uh, or it should be perceived as resistance. Such a broad approach does qualify disobeying laws and oral protest as resistance, which seems especially justified since in difference to other groups of the German population, Jews were exposed to racial persecution and specific anti-Jewish legislation. When one applies this new definition to the analysis of the Nazi society, it does produce astonishing results of individual Jewish opposition. Even just looking at well-known photographs um, gives us a different perspective under this new kind of broader understanding. For example, this picture is widely uh, used as illustrating the first wave of terror uh, during uh, February and March 1933. This is Michael Siegel in the center, dragged by stormtroopers um, through Munich. However, if you look closer, this was not an act of random terror against uh, anybody. It was, he had uh, uh, protested at a police station against the arrest of a client. Or, Take this picture, which I used in my classroom uh, to illustrate local restrictions against Jews, which shows these signs. Um, but look at Dora Franken's body language. This is not somebody who kind of backs down. She has a very defiant pose. So looking at pictures we have already known in a different light shows us that even Taking pictures can be an act of resistance. Look at this one. Uh, Martin Marx uh, took a picture of his family and the maid in front of the house with an anti-Jewish slogan um, painted in 1935. 
Or this is my favorite picture, uh, Lizzie Rosenfeld in Vienna. She committed three offenses, uh, um, which are documented with this picture. First, sitting on a bench, which was only permitted for Aryans then letting somebody uh, taking a picture of it and later smuggling this picture out so that it's today uh, deposited at the U.S. Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And more recently, we uh, discovered that Jews uh, took pictures to document the crimes and the destruction uh, as a result of the uh, program of November 1938. And this is uh, one of the different research I'm doing on the destruction of Jewish homes during Kristallnacht, which is uh, uh, also not well known. So Jews documented the vandalism in their own homes uh, as an act um, to, uh, of resistance. So, but in general, uh, maybe I stop this here. Uh, in general, I don't want to just kind of uh, accumulate uh, surprising, uh, interesting accounts of uh, individual Jewish defiance. What I try to do is also to contextualize and systematize these acts of resistance. And um, this is, I think, possible more now than maybe uh, two decades ago, because our knowledge during the last decades is so much richer about the often very contradictory policy developments uh, on the local, regional and national level in uh, Nazi Germany. And uh, with this richer knowledge, we can actually much better understand what the Jews really responded to. The second reason for the absence of individual resistance from the traditional Holocaust narrative lies in the previously limited pool of sources. Uh, almost exclusively, historians used Gestapo, SS, or other, other administrative reports, as well as diaries and memoirs of survivors to document Jewish attitudes. Yet, in Interestingly for me, in both set of sources, individual Jewish resistance is rarely mentioned. By contrast, my study is based on a, a comparative microhistorical research, which uh, uh, led me to the archives in Berlin, Hamburg, Frankfurt, Munich, Dresden, Leipzig, and Vienna. But I also looked into smaller places, not just into big cities. Uh, the 12 years of research surfaced a full set of uh, unused material, including police records, police logbooks, record, records of special courts and other courts. Um, and I also added a thorough investigation of 170 uh, inter video interviews of the USC Shoah Foundation Visual History Archive. While some of those video interviews confirmed the results of the archival research, they also brought to light some uh, astonishing new insights, which are not documented in paper records. So let me start with the overview, how Jews uh, uh, responded to the persecution since 1933. As a result of this very long research, I uh, defined five types of German Jewish resistance. Um, you see here contesting Nazi propaganda or also anti Jewish uh, um, kind of propaganda, then uh, oral protest, written protest, defying anti Jewish laws and local restrictions, and then the last. Um, chapter is a physical self-defense. And I say chapter because this is practically uh, the structure of my book manuscript, uh, which each chapter tells one main story of one resistor embedded in the life uh, of this resistor, and then brings up similar accounts of uh, this type of resistance um, after the main story. So let me start with the first point uh, contesting Nazi propaganda. So interestingly, although I did a long kind of for decades uh, research on Jews in Germany, uh, uh, only this research led me to findings that uh, Jews actually actively fought Nazi propaganda. 
throughout the 1930s, uh, Jews were arrested in Munich and Hamburg for besmearing the displays of anti-Semitic newspapers like the Stürmer, for contesting the Hitler salute in public, and for destroying Nazi flags, uh, anti-Jewish posters, and Nazi symbols. For example, David Bornstein, um, who was a Jewish merchant in Hamburg, uh, tried to destroy the swastika logo on a public bus or a local bus in Hamburg in 1936. He was waiting uh, for the departure of his wife at the bus station and took his walking stick. And uh, with both hands, he tried to scratch and uh, to damage the uh, swastika logo on the public bus. A bus driver caught him red-handed in the act. He was interrogated by the Gestapo and later put on trial. Here's a picture of uh, what the Gestapo reenacted, uh, this, uh, how he tried to destroy uh, the, the logo. Uh, he received five weeks in jail for, this, uh, uh, for damaging uh, the swastika. Uh, however, the story doesn't end here. After serving the sentence, uh, he uh, had a criminal record. And as quite a few of the resistors uh, in the early period, he uh, fell victim to the raid against so-called Asian socials in June 1938. Uh, so a lot of those who publicly protested or did other things against the Nazi regime were actually brought into concentration camps as uh, victims of this raid. Uh, some of them uh, died. David Bornstein was lucky he made it out of Germany and would settle with his wife uh, later in Palestine. But also later, even during the war, there are records that Jews were arrested, uh, for example, in Leipzig, for ripping down Nazi flags and anti-Jewish posters. The second uh, part, uh, oral protest. Um, Jews started right away in 1933 to publicly criticize uh, the uh, Nazi government, anti-Jewish measures, and this is really literally starts uh, in March and April 1933. For example, in Frankfurt, several Jews were prosecuted by the um, state court in Frankfurt for publicly criticizing the beatings of Jews and uh, some murders by stormtroopers and also the torture of Jews in these early wild concentration camps. For example, on the day of the notorious anti-Jewish boycott, April 1st, 1933, the state court in Frankfurt sentenced the merchant Erich Löwenstein, who was born in 1908, with uh, the hard punishment of one year in prison for spreading rumors. What did he do? A few days earlier, Löwenstein had spoken with some acquaintances who happened to be members of the Nazi party. He interrogated them if the Nazis wanted to drive out the Jews or harm the Jews in any way. He also inquired uh, if the news are true that Jews have been killed in these wild concentration camps. This is what uh, brought him for one year uh, in, uh, to jail. Throughout the next years, Jewish men and women spoke up in public against uh, the persecution. For example, Rosalie Kowalski in Frankfurt, she was born in 1887, repeatedly cursed the Hitler pack in public and told everybody who wanted to know that Goebbels would just tell lies. She received six months in prison in 1937. As many of these uh, protesters or Jews who criticized in public um, anti-Jewish measures, she was um, receiving the sentence under the law against treacherous attacks on the state and the party uh, from December 1934. Normally we thought this uh, law served the Nazi state as a legal tool against communists and social democrats. 
That's what the literature says. Interestingly, throughout Germany and all the archives, there's plenty of evidence that the Nazis used specifically this law to quell any public critique or protest of Jews um, um, in the Third Reich. And they did this too to those who critiqued uh, the violent attacks in November 1938. For example, uh, uh, as in the case of Henriette Schaefer. She was born in 1882 and lived in a mixed marriage. The day after the program, she entered a shop in Frankfurt and approached uh, the owner of the shop, uh, asking him, quote, what are you saying about the fact that everything is being destroyed and the synagogues are arson? end of quote. The owner responded with the official narrative uh, that the people are outraged uh, about the murder of a German diplomat by a Jew. Schaefer replied, quote, this is not the people, but the government. They are all blackguards, scams, and criminals. Hitler is the biggest bandit. If I could, I would poison them all, end of quote. Under the Twitches a tax law, she received six months in prison for her public comment. She, after serving the sentence, uh, she stayed in Frankfurt, was uh, deported with one of the last transports from Germany in February 1945 to the ghetto to Reisenstadt, where she fortunately survived. It took, here, uh, took her almost until her death in 1951 to try to clear up her criminal record which was kind of uh, um, manifested by the sentence uh, from Nazi Germany. Some other examples are, for example, uh, from the city of Vienna. Uh, in summer 1939, uh, Vienna expelled many uh, Jewish uh, renters from municipal housing. Um, Dr. Arthur Singer was arrested at the municipal housing office because at uh, the city hall, he loudly cursed Hitler and uh, tried to urge uh, fellow Jews who also waited uh, in front of the housing office to join his protest against the city orders um, who expelled all these uh, Jewish tenants and to storm the offices. Another case is uh, from Berlin where the Berlin police chief limited the shopping hours for Jews to only one hour in the late afternoon in July 1940. The widow Hedwig Hornung ignored this local rule and after a shop owner declined her request to sell her bread at a different time than the limited hour for Jews, she snapped and exclaimed, quote, the new decree that is too much. Soon we won't get ration cards anymore either and we will die a wretched dead, end of quote. The next part is about the written protest. And this is uh, a very diverse uh, um, kind of record because written protest ranged from petitions Jews authored to anonymous leaflets. So interestingly, we all know as uh, Holocaust historians who dealt with Nazi Germany that uh, dozens and dozens of individual Jews uh, intervened with written petitions uh, throughout the 1930s. These entreaties can be found in large numbers in almost any given German archive. However, most historians have neglected Jewish petitions as written in vain, since Nazi authorities rejected the requests in many cases. However, uh, recent research, um, which can, uh, is published in this book, which was mentioned by Brian in the, in, uh, during the introduction, resisting um, um, uh, about the petitions of the Jews, um, this established this research that these entreaties in reality should be recognized at, uh, as acts of resistance because the Jews did not just 
wanted to be exempt from certain laws and restrictions, which in itself is already a contestation of the classification by the regime. But in many of these petitions, they protest persecution in general or against very particular measures. They even claimed in these petitions uh, their right as taxpayers, as citizens, and also as Germans, and thus challenging directly the prerogative of Nazi persecution. For example, on February 23rd, 1933, Frieda F. appealed to the Reich President Hindenburg to stop the public incitement to programs in violent attacks on Jews. In 1934, Julius Fromm, a well-known entrepreneur in Berlin, protested in a petition to the police president that his citizenship had been revoked. He insisted that uh, he was a German and underlined that he had more than fulfilled his duty to his home country. In 1935, in May, when the government excluded Jews from military service, Paula Tobias wrote a fierce complaint about her son's ouster from the German army to the Reich War Ministry. When in summer 1935, stormtroopers, Hitler Youth and other Germans targeted Jewish stores in several districts of the German capital, they defaced store windows and sidewalks in front of the shops with humiliating slogans and even physically attacked Jews and foreigners which they mistook for Jews. While individual store owners wrote petitions uh, to the police chief, also at the time anonymous leaflets circulated in Berlin. For example, a business card sized flyer was found in the mailbox of the biggest publishing house in Berlin containing the following message, I quote, Germany is a cultural disgrace today. I'm a German Jew and loyal to the emperor. In fact, the Germans should expel the foreigner Hitler. Down with Hitler, end of quote. Even during the war, many Jews still complained about the radicalized, now much more radicalized persecution. In letters to Reich Kommissar and Gauleiter Birkel, Jews in Vienna contested anti Jewish measures. Especially numerous were the petitions criticizing the eviction from their private homes. In March 1940, Adolf Fleischmann protested against uh, losing his rental apartment for 25 years in a petition to the Vienna Party Gauleiter. At the same time, Katie Kern, who was born in 1892 in Vienna, commented in a private letter uh, on the evictions. She was arrested uh, in September 1940 and spent two weeks in jail for this comment on the evictions in her letter. And here is an interesting fact. While the Nazis perceived even the most critical petition as legitimate, as a legitimate tool for Jews to air grievances or even protest. Such critical comments in private letters or on leaflets were seen as treacherous and aiming at the erosion of the trust of the German people and were punished uh, under the treacherous attacks law. For example, in Berlin, the former tailor Alfred Levitan, he was born in 1913, had already been castigated for public comments harming the German state with nine months in jail. However, not even this jail sentence would stop him. In spring 1940, he smuggled letters into mail order catalogs, which were printed in a prison, calling for an uprising and blaming Germany's war on Hitler's mistake to uh, persecute the Jews. The special court in Berlin sentenced him as a frequent offender to five years in prison. In 1942, the Gestapo deported Levitan to the east where he died in Majdanek. In Munich, the former real estate broker Benno Neuberger, a man in his 60s, had lost his fortune 
during the inflation and also his children to the immigration. They lived now in the United States. In fall 1941, for Neuberger, the introduction of the Yellow Star was the last straw. He, despite all the Hitler attacks against Jews, had still uh, kind of perceived himself as a proud German living in Bavaria. But with the new order about the Yellow Star, he felt kind of humiliated, ostracized, and also unprotected. But he didn't want to give in to the Nazis. So between September 1941 and February 1942, he applied Hitler post stamps to dozens of postcards, stamps like this, and wrote abusive comments on them. The first postcard read, and I quote, the eternal mass murderer Hitler, disgusting, exclamation mark. Another postcard bore the foresighted comment, murderer of five million. This was in, at the end of 1941. The Gestapo arrested him uh, from a picture uh, in the Gestapo records. Um, I assume that they tortured him because if you look closely here, you see bruises on his face. Uh, uh, he was put on trial for treason, uh, transferred to Berlin, to the Berlin People's Court. And really stunning is that even in front of the judges of the uh, Berlin People's Court, he openly told the audience that he hated Hitler, and especially because Hitler had pronounced or announced in January 1939, that he, in a case of a world war, he would exterminate the European jury. In a trial of only two hours, uh, Benno Neuberger received the death penalty and he was decapitated by the guillotine uh, in September 1942. Throughout the 1930s, uh, many Jews defied local anti Jewish restrictions, and this is also a little bit better known from memoirs because uh, they visited uh, forbidden swimming pools, libraries, cinemas, and so on. Um, after the 1938 program, Jews also disobeyed national anti Jewish rules, for example, to hand over precious metals, to wear a special identification card, or to adopt the discriminatory middle name Sarah and Israel. Interestingly, which uh, we really have to have in mind, uh, the Germans could not just order the uh, middle names onto the Jews. Every Jew had to actually fill out a form and apply for the name change according to German law. So in Berlin, the 68-year-old painter Max Antlers declined the repeated request to fill out the necessary application forms even after he was summoned to the police station. In Leipzig, the 73-year-old Ida Schneider didn't apply for the identification card and refused to adopt the name Sarah. She was detected only... Go on, Wolf, I, I took care of that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, she refused to uh, apply for the identification card and uh, to adopt the name Sarah. She was only detected in 1941. That means two and a half years later, uh, she received a seven months prison sentence for her acts. Um, and she, did the, she received this act under the treacherous attacks law. Other acts of defiance against uh, anti-Jewish legislation or national laws were penalized under different uh, laws. For example, when Jews didn't hand over their radios, they were punished under the law against radio crimes. Laura Rechenitz in Vienna was sent to jail using the German penal code after she had broken the curfew for Jews introduced in September 1939. Breaking the curfew to visit bars, restaurants, cinemas, or theaters seemed to have been common among Jews, regardless of age. Yet some Jews broke the curfew for other reasons, as for example, Max 
Oops. Let me stop the share and reshare this because uh, it was not moving. Hmm. Sorry about this. Oh, okay, here we are. Sorry. Um, so Max Mannheimer worked as a forced laborer uh, in Bohemia. And uh, this is one of the few citations I found in the diary. Um, he quote, uh, he said in his diary, quote, my home is in a wooden hut behind the tool shed. From there I go to the public park despite the 8 p.m. curfew and despite the ban to visit the park. On my way, I count the signs with the slogan, Forbidden for Jews. In total, there are six. Later, at 11 p.m., I rip the signs out of the ground and throw some of them in the bushes, some of them in the creek. However, all my courage proved futile. The next evening, all the signs had reemerged. And for a second time, I don't have the courage. I'm just not a hero. I think probably most of you would disagree with this description because uh, going a second time to check on uh, his success uh, is already, again, an another act of defiance. This happened in Bohemia in 1940. In Frankfurt, Hans Oppenheimer also left uh, his home at night and bro broke the curfew. He was only 17 years old, but had already worked for one year in a forced labor camp. Because of Allied air raids, not a single light illuminated the street or the whole city of Frankfurt. In the dark, Hans waited anxiously every, every evening, evening that the British bombers would attack Frankfurt. When the sirens started to blare, he rushed to the next fire alarm post and pulled the handle. When the alarm bell rang, Hans had achieved his goal to divert the fire trucks from the actual bombing sites. The Gestapo put a trap uh, and arrested Hans Oppenheimer in December 1940. The court sentenced him to three years in prison for setting off more than a dozen fire alarms. Probably there were many more because the records say that in his area there were 44 wrong fire alarms in this period of time but he only admitted to 12. After almost two years in jail, he was deported to Auschwitz where he uh, was murdered. During the war, German Jewish men and women uh, had to perform forced labor and many of them also got arrested for sabotage or refusing to work. Uh, Jews successfully managed to escape arrests, reloc relocations and deport deportations uh, as for example, as the mass transport started, an estimated um, 10 to 12,000 Jews went into uh, underground to ha live under false identities or ha in hiding, as new books on Berlin and Munich demonstrate in detail. Just during uh, seven, uh, February 27, 1943, uh, three, during the so-called factory raid in Berlin, more than 4,000 Jews went into hiding within one day. This constituted the biggest mass resistance performed by individual Jews against Nazi policies, and there was no organization at all. Let me come to my last point, physical self-defense. Even more astonishing as the protest and the other defiance are unknown acts of Jewish physical self-defense that emerge in numbers from the new sources. From the interviews of the uh, Visual History Archive of the USC Shoah Foundation, we learned that Jewish men got into brawls with stormtroopers on the street or with Nazi neighbors who discriminated against Jews in their apartment houses. For example, in Berlin, Frank Teilig beat up two stormtroopers who terrorized an old Jewish lady in his apartment building. Only due to a sympathetic policeman, he made it out uh, uh, without a trial. He uh, fled uh, immediately Germany and ended up in Shanghai. D 
During the devastating pogrom uh, in 1938, some Jews physically resisted their attackers. For example, in Pain in Lower Saxony, a group of SS men invaded the Marburger family apartment and started to beat up the father of the family. Uh, the son of uh, the family, a 17 year old boy, tried to defend his father and to fight off the SS men. Unfortunately, they overwhelmed him, dragged him out of the house and locked him up uh, in the synagogue. There he was shot to death before they set ablaze the synagogue with gasoline. And another case um, from another young uh, Jew was um, the case of Daisy Gronowski. Daisy Gronowski was a 16 year old from Berlin originally. She was a member of Hashomer Hatzair, the uh, youth uh, Zionist organization. And at the time of the program lived in a retraining camp where she got training in agriculture to prepare for her immigration to Palestine. This camp, as many of these retraining camps, came under attack during the program. Stormtroopers uh, uh, rushed in, destroyed the furniture, furniture um, in the main hall of the, the camp, and then started to beat up first uh, the male teenagers and then even uh, the female teenagers. And Daisy Gronowski, when a stormtrooper tried to attack her, used a jiu-jitsu trick, which she had learned in her Hashomer Hatzair uh, organization back in Berlin, and uh, was able to uh, overwhelm the stormtrooper and uh, twist a knife which he had in his hand out of his hand and uh, stabbed him with his own knife so that he fell unconscious. She was able to uh, escape and uh, later on escaped, uh, escaped two other arrests um, uh, uh, during the next weeks after the program and finally ended up uh, making her way to England uh, uh, and survived. Some Jews even prepared to resist with arms in case they would be caught, uh, which seems quite extraordinary for wartime Germany. Uh, for example, at the evening of August 30th in 1943, policemen encountered Kurt Jacobson walking a street in Berlin. When he reached in his pocket after they called his name, they shot Jacobson since they expected him to be armed. Why would they expect him to be armed? They had discovered by accident that uh, he, Jacobson, as a former forced laborer, ran a business using a forged identity for a non-Jewish German entrepreneur who had aryanized a Jewish factory and had no kind of skills in managing a factory. And uh, Jacobson was a former merchant, so he, with the forged identity, managed the whole factory. He was provided a secret apartment in the factory by the owner, where he stored several handguns and live ammunition as well as suitcases and identification papers of other Jews, which the Discapo, uh, as I said, uh, uh, discovered by accident in a raid. And this is the uh, entry in the police logbook, which revealed uh, the circumstances of his uh, arrest and his death. So let me come to the conclusion. Three weeks after Nazi Germany invaded Poland in 1939, the 30-year-old aided Brits wrote a letter that was intercepted. Earlier, she had already been denunciated for so-called race defilement and political conversations with non-Jewish Germans. Fortunately for her, in contrast to all the cases I mentioned earlier, Witnesses had vouched for her and no repercussions had followed. However, in this confiscated letter, the Jewish woman from Berlin described that one morning at 6 a.m., two police officers knocked on her door. In that moment, 
she felt like she would do anything to prevent them from coming and arrest her. She wrote in the letter, quote, I'm so upset that I could attack anybody who wants to come into my pad. I will go crazy if there will be more. They stole my sleep. They stole everything from me, end of quote. This citation reveals the level of anxiety, anger, and repulsion that many Jews must have felt after experiencing years of persecution. It is not too far-fetched to assume that such emotions might have triggered many of the individual actions I cited of the Jewish woman and man. Defining resistance as any individual or group action against laws, actions, and intentions of the Nazis changes our perspective. Now we understand for the first time what the trope of the impudent Jew to which Gestapo and SS referred in their reports really meant. Actual acts of opposition and resistance of individual Jews. While my research brought to light in an incredible amount of courageous acts. And every, almost every Jewish man and woman had to develop, parti develop particular and over time changing strategies, how to respond to persecution. It does not mean what I presented here that every Jew responded in this way, but many more than we ever expected actually did. First, they acted against Nazi propaganda and economic exclusionary measures, then against violence and local restrictions, later against segregation, forced labor, and deportation. As I already uh, mentioned, five prominent types of individual Jewish resistance are identified by this research. First, contesting Nazi propaganda, which includes accounts how Jews defaced Nazi symbols, destroyed anti-Jewish signs, and ripped down Nazi propaganda posters. Oral protest encompasses how Jews criticized in public anti-Jewish policies and laws in offices, restaurants, on the streets, in their neighborhoods. Written protest includes petitions and letters challenging the persecution, as well as anonymous postcards and leaflets condemning the regime and its leaders. Defying anti-Jewish laws shows how Jews ignored, neglected, or actively fought against the increasing number of anti-Jewish laws, as well as uh, measures enacted by local governments. And finally, physical self-defense is the category for Jews resisting attacks, verbal attacks, but also violent attacks by stormtroopers uh, and other Nazis. Many German Jews committed multiple offenses at the same time. Others committed kind of a row, a chain of offenses. And some were not even deterred when they ended up in jail for their offenses. Some might question if all these small acts of defiance really count as resistance. First of all, one argument is success, but success should not qualify what is resistance. Another argument is um, that they were too small to change anything. But this is actually not true because uh, the Nazis somehow changed their policies to adopt uh, and quell this kind of anti-Jewish uh, behavior. But moreover, I would say it is not up to the public, our scholars, or even the victims to define what is resistance. In the end, it only matters what the Nazis perceived and thought about the impudent Jews. They define what is resistance. As my research proved with many details, the smallest act of individual Jewish opposition, even some words, would perceived by them as a threat and resulted in harsh punishment by Nazi courts, often or mostly with jail sentences under very different legislations. 
However, most of these acts, although they were really widespread, are forgotten today, since many of the actors perished. I want to emphasize here, when we, under this broader conce concept, perceive all individual actions against the Nazis as resistance, this also democratizes our gendered view of resistance. It ends this kind of male uh, dominant, dominance in resistance, because by giving equal value to all acts which were punish punished by the Germans as resistance, it does actually highlight, as you might have glimpsed in my presentation, the many ways Jewish women resisted during the Holocaust. It also reveals that such courage existed in all elements of the Jewish population, regardless of age, beliefs, or social status. Maybe there are a few trends I saw throughout my research more men than women might have engaged in physical self-defense, more elderly Jews than younger Jews fought the forced name changes, and I think slightly more women seem to have publicly criticized the persecution. However, although I found hundreds of cases, this sample is still small because many cases of defiance and protest still remain unknown. There are many archives I couldn't explore yet, and not every incident left traces in the archives for historians. So, in sum, uh, to appreciate and commemorate the courageous efforts of so many German Jews and Austrian Jews, our standard Holocaust narrative needs to be thoroughly updated by integrating their accounts and stories. As Berlin Rabbi Max Nussbaum recalled in the 1960s, and I quote, we were besieged in a hundred of different manners, and therefore we fought back in a hundred of different manners, end of quote. Applying such a broader resistance lens also to other Nazi-occupied countries, for example, France, will help us to telling a richer story of Jewish individual and community responses during the Holocaust. That so many people resisted Nazi measures finally gives back agency to the Jews and renders claims of their passivity during the Holocaust obsolete once and for all. Thank you very much.